So last time we talked about atoms, right? Yeah. You guys remember that stuff? Dude, that was science overload. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's more. Okay. So um, I kind of wanted to go back over to the stuff kind of a little bit because I, at the end, I was like, I didn't really do a great job on that last part. So we talked about kind of some assumptions that go along with these different dating methods, right? Do you remember what some of those were? One of which was assuming that all the conditions were perfect and that, oh, my point, it went away. Okay. Rate of decay is the same? Rate of decay is the same, right? So that we have these half-lives that have been calculated and some people might say, oh, we can't know a half-life of, of a radioactive element if we're not there to observe the whole decay, right? But that's not really true. We can put aside a known amount of a radioactive element for 100 years or so, come back, and then measure the differential mass and determine how much has decayed in that finite amount of time, and then we can extrapolate it to millions of years. So those half-lives of those different elements that we talked about are millions and billions of years, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that correlates to the Earth is that old, right? So yeah, one of them was um, the rate of decay has always been constant, and those are assumptions that these scientists make in order to utilize these dating methods, right? So if there are different decay rates, right, if it was faster or slower in the past, then it's going to affect the ages we come to. And then the, the telltale sign of that is if you take different dating methods and you date the same sample, they oftentimes give different numbers, right? Which you wouldn't expect if all the decay rates were the same, you use them all, they should all agree. Now the interesting thing with that is if you go and you read about this stuff, people who defend these dating methods and say that the Earth is millions and billions of years old will say that that's not true. And so there's this kind of discord among you know, secular scientists and creation scientists about whether or not there's validity to these dating methods. And so that's mm -hmm. kind of one of the first things I wanted to say tonight is that there's a lot of stuff out there and don't just take my word for it, okay? Because I'm not a radioactive dating method guy, right? So I've, I've gone and I've kind of, yeah, I know, you're, what? you're bummed, aren't you? Bummed? I don't know. You got them in Florida tonight, though, so that's pretty I'm, sweet. I'm, yeah, sixth of one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, and it, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, if you go out and you read some of this, some of this other material from people who aren't Christians, you're going to come across stuff that's very contrary to what you read on, say, a Christian-based website, right? And so it's kind of <clears throat> up to us to kind of sift through this and kind of look at these different opinions, right? And one way we can do that is by looking at the Bible and looking at uh, the historical context of the Bible. You know, we went through the whole biblical authority for two weeks, right? And that was kind of to set this whole up, this whole thing up, because in the end we have to make a decision if we want to believe these dating methods or if we want to hold fast to something that we've already determined is complete truth, complete authority, right? And so there may be scientific evidence of something, but that doesn't necessarily give it complete authority, complete truth, right? Uh, another one that we talked about was all daughter elements came from parent elements, right? So this is another assumption. Um, and so that was a problem as far as contamination of samples. And I read you that quote that said that the US Geological Survey Association or something like that, where they're like, we only pick samples that are not contaminated. And you're just like, okay, how do you determine whether or not it was contaminated 100 million years ago or something like that, right? So it's just kind of interesting how they say superficial things like that, but there's not really any evidence to support you know, the validity of that. Um, and then another assumption is that they're only parent atoms in the beginning. So a lot of times they date igneous rocks because you can kind of determine when that rock was formed, right? So if you date limestone or other hard rocks, 
then it's difficult to determine when that rock was actually formed. But igneous rock, it's like lava or some magma or something like that, and it cools. And that's when the rock was formed, right? And so we talked about potassium argon dating, um, and that's the um, decay of potassium-40 into argon-40. Argon is a gas, and so if you <coughs> heat up a rock that contains argon, then that argon is going to evaporate. It's going to re be released from that rock. And then when it cools, there isn't going to be any argon in there, right? And so then you can track potassium decay into argon. This is the theory behind potassium argon dating. And so um, some issues with that are just because we observe that in rocks that are formed today, you know, that there isn't any argon when they're formed doesn't mean that this rock that you just picked up didn't have any argon at first. Also, if that rock was reheated, right, then there's no telling when it was reheated in the past, and so there's just, there's no real way to control for all the different uh, variables when you're dating these things, okay? So, just a review of that, because I wanted to make sure that that's uh, fresh. So, carbon-14 dating. You guys have heard a lot about it, right? It's one of the big things that evolutionists talk about, and it's one of the big buzzwords when it comes to the age of things, right? Interesting thing about carbon-14 dating that not a lot of people know is that it doesn't really date rocks, okay? So carbon is uh, an organic molecule, right? It makes up living things. We're made of carbon. Sorry, Blake. I know you hate carbon and you don't even believe it exists. Yeah, I don't think it exists. But you got a ton of carbon in you, okay? Maybe you do. <laughs> but the point, the point being is that only living things have carbon, right? So rocks, if they're made up of minerals or other uh, sediments or whatever, they're not going to contain carbon. So you can't pick up a random rock and use carbon-14 dating to date it. It, it. But if you have some sort of a fossil or maybe a plant that died and turned into coal, that's carbon, right? So we can look at and analyze different samples like that that have carbon, that were once alive, that are now dead, but they still contain carbon, right? Um, we talked about the uh, half-life. I don't remember what it was. You guys remember what it was? You write it down. <coughs> Come on, let me uh, 5,730 years. Right, okay. So, uh, the half-life of carbon-14, to nitrogen-14, is what? 5730. 5730 years. Okay? So, this is kind of relatively short compared to the other ones, right? So we talked about some that were 700 million, 4.5 billion, right? So, if it's this short, eventually all the carbon-14 might turn into all nitrogen-14, right? And then you wouldn't even have any carbon-14 to date. So, there is kind of a limit to this dating method. So, it's not going to be able to prove billions of years. It's really only able to go up to about 55,000 or 80,000 theoretical years, right? So, that's kind of the limit of this dating method is... 55 to 80,000 years. And then by that time, there's gonna be so little carbon-14 that you're not gonna be able to distinguish it from a false test, right? So if you, have, if you test a sample that doesn't have any carbon-14, it might still say, oh, there's a little bit, but that's really just an instrument error, right? And we talked about that in the first couple lessons that science is error-prone. These machines are not perfect and then the scientists doing them, definitely using them, aren't perfect either, right? So there is that element of error involved in any scientific test, especially with these dating methods. Um, and then after about one million years, there's really just no shot of carbon-14 being in anything, right? Because this half-life isn't a set thing, it's just kind of a probability, right? So every 5,730 years, most likely, it's gonna be 
have the carbon-14 in, in, in the nitrogen-14. It's not a, okay, I'm not going to turn into nitrogen-14 because my other carbon-14 buddy turned into nitrogen-14, right? So it's just a, a probability <coughs> of half of it turning into nitrogen-14. Would a secular scientist agree with that, or is that from a Christian perspective? No, that, that is true because it's, like I said, you know, these carbon atoms aren't going to make sure that only half of it turns in, right? So, so we get this half-life from an average. So you're not going to just do one sample. You're going to do multiple samples, and then you, you measure some. Some might be 5,710 years. Some might be 5,750 years. But this is kind of the average based on the stability of carbon-14, right? Because that's what determines the half-life is the stability of this radioactive element. And we kind of talked about how in the nucleus there's neutrons and protons, right? And there is this um, desire for these atoms to be in a low energy state. But if the ratio of neutrons to protons isn't right, then the, the nucleus isn't going to be in a low energy state. So that's why the, this is radioactive is because there are how many neutrons, how many protons? Seven, six. six. Six minutes. It's carbon. I have no idea. So carbon has to have seven protons because that's what makes it carbon is the number of protons in the nucleus, right? But it has the atomic number 14. Wait, am I doing that right? I think it's six and eight. Uh-oh. <laughs> no, it can't be six and eight because it's seven and seven. It has to be uneven, right? No, yeah. It's six and eight. I don't know. Yeah, six. I don't know what I'm saying. Good job. Is it? Good Scratch job. that. Because carbon has six protons. I'm freaking out. You're on it. That's why, that's why I bring Andrew. He's Fact got, check. He's got yeah. the back. Yeah. Well, the statement. Right. So, so carbon is carbon because it has six protons in the nucleus, right? And then no matter how many neutrons it has, Six protons makes carbon carbon. And then carbon 12 would be six protons, six neutrons, very stable because there's this good ratio of protons to neutrons. Don't ask me how that works. Nuclear forces and all that stuff makes it stable in the nucleus, right? So this is unstable, so it wants to make it wants to go back to a good ratio, right? So it goes through beta decay. One of those neutrons turns into a proton, and then we have seven neutron, seven protons for nitrogen 14, okay? So that's how the half-life works. So the question then becomes, where do we get our carbon 14? Okay, so we're gonna go through the carbon 14 cycle. So we have the, Blake? Huh? What's this? That's it. I, I can't see it. You can't see it? The sun. The sun. Orange six. I don't see anything. Only, the sun only Blake can answer? I don't get it. Well, I just... That's prejudice. I don't know. <laughs> well, Blake reads books and stuff, so him. I just... I feel like he should know everything. Yeah, but he's still at school. The sun's going to be blue now. <laughs> oh! Well, I see it. Pretty crazy stuff, right? Blue sun. Okay. So the sun <laughs> spits out all these... What? Like solar flare. Will you calm down? <laughs> Yeah, that, that'll come into play here in a minute. Aren't we having some of those, or we you, or we did recently? When they happen all that matter doesn't have to do with science. Go yeah. ahead. Okay, so the, the sun has a ton of energy, right? And so sometimes it spits out energy, and then it travels to Earth in the form of radiation. Okay? So as it enters the atmosphere, some of the Earth's magnetic field, uh, or the Earth's magnetic field, gets rid of some of that radiation, right? It kind of shields the Earth from the bulk of the radiation. But at some point, some of that radiation is going to enter the atmosphere, okay? So we have some radiation enters the atmosphere where it encounters different <coughs> atoms in the atmosphere, right? Because it's made up of gases. What is the primary component of the Earth's atmosphere? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, right? So the way it works is it can, this radiation can bump into other atoms and fragment those nuclei to where you just have 
neutrons floating around in the sky. Now, those neutrons are going to have a ton of energy, right? Because it takes a ton of energy to break up the nucleus of an atom. And now that that neutron has a ton of energy, if we have nitrogen 14 right here, and then we have this high energy neutron, it's going to bump into this nitrogen. and it's going to displace the proton. So it's going to collide with the nucleus of the nitrogen-14 atom, and it's going to replace one of the protons with the neutron, which gives us carbon-14. Okay, So that's how we get carbon-14. And then once we have carbon-14, it can combine with uh, oxygen and make CO2. Or it could already be combined with oxygen, right? So we have, yeah. So hang on. So if I'm made up of a bunch of carbon, yeah, and carbon gets here because the sun shines here? This is not the only way carbon gets here. Because that's freaking me out. Right, no, that, this is not the only way. And they so, still believe in evolution. That's what's yeah, kind of yeah. freaking me out at the moment. So God created all the atoms, right? So that's where we get carbon. But this is just a cycle that gives us this isotope of carbon, right? So mass can either be created nor destroyed. You can only change form. So we're changing the form of this mass, right? And we're releasing some energy, and we're making this high-energy, unstable carbon. And then from there, we can track its degradation using carbon-14 dating. Okay, so what happens to CO2? Plants eat it. Exactly. So we're going to make a little tree here. Yeah. I like color coding things because it makes me happy. I learned this is the nitrogen cycle. Okay, so plants take in the CO2 and they make oxygen. Oxygen, but that doesn't matter for us. Just talking about matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> and they make come on, Andrew. Sugar. Oh, glucose. glucose. Right? So they make different kinds of sugar like cellulose and stuff like that. And then what eats plants? <laughs> Vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy people, right? <laughs> and rabbits. <laughs> yeah, okay, here's the ground. I'm going to do this mirror image. You ready for this? Oh, that's not as good. Brandon makes me nervous. I know he's going to watch this. I can tell you he watched it. He doesn't really watch it. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sure he does. I made so much fun of him. I made so much fun of him that like. Same thing you drew earlier. Now that brought it home right there. Now he's happy. Yeah, see, because he's a happy dinosaur because he's eating the tree, right? Because that's what I'm talking about. The animals eat trees, right? Not the people, because the people eat. Animals. The animals, exactly. That's right. So here we have a little person. I have steak and dinner. It's here. And he's going to eat the animal later. Okay? He better get a bigger spoon. <laughs> <laughs> but don't they say that humans and dinosaurs were not alive at the same time? Or is this just like a hypothetical situation? This is a hypothetical okay. situation. Right. We're good. The majority of scientists will say that this didn't happen. But I'm tying into the dinosaur theme for later with the dinosaur. He's got a really weird belly here. He's got some weird stuff. If you were in my class, you would be the kid I would come home and tell you about. Hey, that's the second dinosaur I've ever drawn in my life. So well, that first one was awesome. It really was. You can only go down from there, right? Yeah. Okay. As good as you can do. So the abundance of carbon 14 that's made isn't a lot. 
right? So it gets incorporated into plants and then they get incorporated into animals, right? So there's this steady state, as long as this animal keeps consuming carbon-14 from trees, then it can still incorporate it into its body, right? But at the same time, the animal poops and gets rid of some stuff, right? So there's kind of this, this flow of carbon-14 through these organisms. And because of that, you end up with this steady state of carbon-14 in your body while you're alive, okay? But then, once you die, <laughs> Never mind, that's the best dinosaur I've ever seen. <laughs> so once the dinosaur dies and it's buried, crap, I drew another dinosaur now. Sweet laying down. Okay, so now we have dinosaurs down here. Still standing. Oh crap. This is the best part, right? Oh, I lost some power. He'll be he'll be sad. Okay. So now this dinosaur <laughs> is dead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> If it's dead, it can't eat the trees, right? That's a fact. <laughs> okay, just checking to make sure you're still living. If it can't eat the trees, like, you okay? It got me tickled. If it can't eat the tree, it can't get any carbon-14, right? So, because of that, man, I can't reel it in. I, when I was going over this, I had no idea it was going to be this funny, but I guess we should have figured. So over time, the carbon-14 con content of this animal is going to decrease, right? So it kind of gives us, let this right now, kind of gives us a little graph. So if this is carbon-14, it's going to decay exponentially. And then, so if this is 50%, then we're going to hit it at about 5,730 years. Okay? But what do we know about carbon-12? Not much. It's stable. it's stable, right? So that graph is going to look like that because the carbon-12 isn't going to change. So when you're going to do carbon-14 dating, you, you do a ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, and that can tell you kind of the, the age of it. But the problem is that... Wait, we're not to the problems yet. Hold off on the problem. So, um, I guess we can get to the problems now. I think I did all of this. Oh, beta decay, right? So I mentioned beta decay. And so when we're down here and we have this carbon-14 in the animal, eventually that's going to decay into nitrogen-14, right? So that's how we lose carbon-14. And that's kind of the cycle, right? And then that can be incorporated back into the atmosphere or in the bacteria or something like that, okay? So um, you can measure the mass um, of carbon-14 that's in the organism and then make that ratio to carbon-12, which will stay the same. Problems. Um, this is under things to consider if you're following along at home. Uh, I talked about the Earth's magnetic field and how it shields the Earth from those rays from the sun, right? From that radioactive, uh, or from that, not radioactive. Ultraviolet. No, what am I, what word am I saying? Radiation, not radioactive, from the sun's radiation, right? So there's a lot of evidence that suggests that <coughs> the magnetic field is decaying, right? Have you ever heard that? 
the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker. So if the Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker, what does that do to the radiation that's coming from the sun? How much of it gets into our atmosphere? More, right? So if there more of it gets into the atmosphere, then we have how much? We have more or less carbon-14. More. More, right? So if you compare that to the past, though, when we have a stronger magnetic field, there's less radiation coming through, which means less carbon-14, which means organisms incorporate less carbon-14, right? which means it would give us older dates. Because if we're looking at, say, in the past, this was 100% carbon-14, right? And then we decay half of it, then we have this difference in amount of carbon-14 when we measure it today. So that would give us elevated ages if the Earth's magnetic field was truly stronger in the past and deflected those radiation uh, waves from the sun. Okay? So if there's m more now, how does that affect the aging? Like it makes it seem like well, there's more and so things are younger or they're older? The problem is the assumptions. So we only know how much carbon-14 is in the atmosphere today. Right. And we use that information to make the assumption that 20,000 years ago it was the same, was the same right? But we don't know that because of this decay in the Earth's magnetic field that would cause a decrease in the amount of carbon-14. <clears throat> okay? Another thing is the decay rate, and we've already touched on that, that it could be faster or slower in the past. Okay? If it was faster in the past, that would result in older appearances, right? Because we wouldn't have as much carbon-14 in these fossils today. Okay, and that would give us older ages. Another thing, um, and scientists aren't really going to agree with this, but flood. So we have all these fossil fuels that are in the ground, right? And there's a lot of evidence to that suggests that there were a lot more plants on the earth pre-flood. Because there wasn't a ton of development, right? So God created the world and he, made, he put plants on the ground. So there's nothing to say that like the whole earth wasn't covered with plants and trees and grass and all this stuff that incorporates this carbon-14 into it itself and then that gets eaten by uh, different animals, right? So if we have twice as many trees, <coughs> What's going to happen to the carbon-14 content? Twice as much? Half. Because you're splitting the amount of carbon-14 between the trees. So if you have one tree sucking in all the carbon-14, then it's going to have a arbitrary, let's give it 10%. This isn't even true. But, but if you add another tree, then you have to split it between the two. So it's 5% in each tree, which means that when that gets incorporated into other living organisms, you already start with a lower amount of carbon-14, and you reach a lower steady state, okay? So this would also cause an increase in the aging, right? So we have all of these different factors that could contribute to an increase in aging based on carbon-14 dating, okay? Very important. Remember that. That seems to be a lot to overcome. Oh, as far as assumptions? Yeah. yeah. Right. That's why... Why do they even talk about this? <laughs> well, that's the thing is if, if you go online and you read people who defend this dating method and, and all these different assumptions, mm -hmm. they really believe it. And they, you know... I'm not as much of an expert that I, I can't really say whether or not they're making good points or, or whatever, but I kind of look at the simple side of it and I kind of look at the logic behind it and I can see, that, I mean, we don't know what happened in the past. That's a fact. You know, if you go back hundreds, 
of years, I mean, it's, it, we don't know the environmental conditions because there, there weren't instruments to measure it. And so there's just no way that we can know stuff like that. And so it's just crazy to me to, to yeah, assume it's, stuff. It's still, see, every time, everything I see like that, I always hear it takes more faith to be an atheist, but that's becoming more and more true. Exactly. The more we look at it. Exactly. So this is carbon-14 vision. Now we're going to, I guess we can just leave that up there. Now I want to get into the dinosaur stuff. And we'll come back to this carbon-14 dating at the end, but I kind of want to give you a timeline of just kind of dinosaur history as far as science is concerned. <coughs> so there's a paleobiologist by the name of Mary Schweitzer, and she, uh, she got her degree in biology from, her PhD in biology from Montana State, but she always loved dinosaurs, and so she went out and did paleontology. And now, um, over the, her career, it truly really paid off, and we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. Um, so she, um, as they were excavating this T-Rex, she was able to get some uh, slices of bone, and she was trying to put them on slides, and she was having trouble putting them on slides, and she could put them on the microscope and, and study them. So she got uh, a micro microscopy friend of hers to help her out, and then this friend ended up taking the slides to a conference, and they were just out where anyone could look at them, and then somebody was looking at these slides, and they said, those are red blood cells on that slide. And so the Mary's friend came back to her and said, hey, I took it to this conference, and this person said, hey, there's red blood cells on here. So they, they took a look, and sure enough, there were these red, round discs that were kind of all lined up in a row, kind of like in a blood vessel, okay? So interesting thing about this is that there's no, like the, the prevailing thought is that dinosaurs died out 65 million years ago, right? There's no way for this material to still be there, right? These intact cells or blood vessels or anything like that. So it was kind of really surprising, obviously, based on the dogma of the day with regard to dinosaurs. Um, they also found different bean <coughs> structures. So those are uh, different structures that house iron in red blood cells, and then that helps part of hemoglobin, right? There are these different metal ions that help attract the oxygen, and so it, it, it helps in the, the carrying of oxygen inside the red blood cells. So in 2005, they, uh, oh, and they published these results, but obviously it was met with a little bit of scrutiny, right? And that's a common theme coming up. But in 2005, they found another T-Rex, um, and it was so big that they had to actually cut the, the femur bone in half and in order to transport it. So they covered it, they cut it in half, covered it in plaster so they would be able to transport it. And then they ended up with bone fragments. And so uh, Mary was looking at these bone fragments and she saw uh, a particular type of bone structure that was very similar to bird bone structures in pregnant birds. So it was called medullary tissue. And so it's just kind of the way the bone is stacked on top of each other, the different structures. So it, it's only present in pregnant birds, and so the idea was that this was a pregnant dinosaur, which was crazy to even think about, that they could identify a pregnant dinosaur. So they, they wanted to look more closely at the structure, so they did some different preparations where they soaked these bone fragments in a mild acid for like four weeks, okay? And then they came back and they started playing around with the stuff that was left over, and they were able to stretch this tissue and then it was able to recoil. So there's kind of this, uh, they looked at more closely at it and it, it, there were branch points and so it kind of looked like blood vessels or vessels of some kind, okay? Um, so they published this, of course, right? You have this great scientific discovery and you write a paper and you publish it. And What does the stretching have to do with it? So we'll get to that in a little bit. Later they identify the proteins. So I mean, we can talk about it now. So, Vessels have to be able to get bigger, right? Dilate and shrink. And so there are different proteins like elastin, kind of like elastic, right? Because it's able to stretch. 
so that it allows the blood vessel to expand and then contracts back when the blood vessel shrinks. And so that's a component of blood vessels. So the acid ate the stuff away that was containing the stretch. It ate the minerals that and stuff. Keeping it. Right. And so but it, it wasn't able to degrade the proteins. And so it ate away like the calcium and the different minerals that are part of the bone. And then you're left with this vessel structure that they were able to manipulate. So it's really cool if you want to go look at there's video of it online. So just type in Mary Schweitzer and you can see the video of it. It's pretty sweet. So presumably do proteins degrade over 65 million years? Is that why this is a big deal? If we'll get to that. Oh, okay. Yes, that's kind of why it's a big deal, right? And so, um, you know, they published this and people came back and said, oh, it was probably these, you know, microbes that ate their way into the bone and then deposited this micro biofilm stuff. And then it formed this little structure and then it was able to, it's kind of like slime that went into where the, the blood vessels were, but it's not actually blood vessels. So that was the explanation. But in 2007, uh, she did more analysis on these samples and she used immunohistochemistry, which I'll give you a quick, as quick as possible. So let's say you have a protein. So we're going to make this protein, and it has these specific structures to them, right? So you can create antibodies against them. You guys know what antibodies are? Okay. They, they're attracted to specific proteins. They are themselves a protein, but they are secreted by our immune system to recognize specific proteins. So if a virus or something makes a protein that's bad for us, our immune system can recognize it, synthesize a protein that recognizes it, and then it can aid in the degradation of that protein. So it prevents the protein from having action. But we use them in science to detect the presence of any protein, okay? So they use these samples and they uh, prepared them and um, they, they had these antibodies against, and this is kind of the, the structure of them, but they, they made antibodies against um, avian, so bird uh, proteins. And this is kind of an interesting thing is that um, the, the, the thought is that birds evolved from dinosaurs, like the T-Rex. So the quote is, um, Proteins shared, the proteins they found shared similar sequence to bird proteins. The quote is, which makes sense as modern birds evolved from theropod dinosaurs such as T-Rex. So real quick, just picture in your head a T-Rex evolving into a seagull or something like that. Okay, so that's, I'll leave that there for you guys to just ponder. So, but they, but they were able to use these antibodies that recognize bird elastin or bird collagen. So collagen is another part of uh, the in-between cells that keeps everything a structure, okay? And they showed that these antibodies recognize these proteins, which means that they're proteins because they don't bind to just anything. They bind to a specific protein at a specific point. So it's a very specific uh, reaction and it says whether or not that specific protein is present or not, okay? So they used immunohistochemistry, they also used mass spectrometry, and I don't know exactly how to explain that, except for they fragment these proteins and then they shoot them really fast through uh, a little nozzle, and then based upon how heavy they are, okay, so if this is our mass spec here, it ionizes these proteins after you fragment them and it shoots them out this little spigot, okay? The heavier proteins are able to go further and they run into this plate, but the lighter proteins can't travel as far because they don't have as much mass, okay? 
And then you can detect how much mass you're getting based on where it hits the plate. And then from that, you can go to databases that have uh, known masses of known protein sequences, and you can say, okay, this is X mass, and it correlates to <coughs> these protein sequences that are already known because we've run purified proteins through this. And then you can say, okay, since it's the same mass, we're getting the same mass uh, spectrum of X and Y together, so those correlate to the same protein based on what we see in our database. That's the best way I can describe it. Any questions on that? Employee. Employee year of organic chemistry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best here. The point is, they were able to identify specific proteins within these samples, which shouldn't have been there, right? Based on the estimate of 65 million years. So, obviously, when they published this, people thought they were insane and they thought of all these different problems with the studies and um, there was this issue of this time frame and how there's no way any organic molecule like that could last this long. So in 2013, she came out and said that, oh, I have an explanation for how long or how this could survive for so long. So um, they did some experiments and found that there was a possibility that iron within these cells were able to kind of lock these proteins in place. It's called cross-linking. So it's kind of like formaldehyde. Have you guys ever, did you guys ever do dissections of pigs or whatever? Or do cats? Get earthworms. Earthworms? Do they smell funny? Terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so that's formaldehyde. And the reason they do that is because it, sure. it, it, by nursing home. <laughs> 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 the reason they do that is because it, it sets everything in place and prevents it from degrading, prevents it from decaying, right? And then we can study it. And so the thought was that these iron uh, particles aided in trapping these proteins and locking them together so that they couldn't be degraded, okay? Um, and that's, I don't know how well that's being received. I tried to look and see like whether or not people are really buying that a whole lot, but um, Another thing that's happened recently is that a totally separate group, so all this stuff was Mary Schweitzer, and she did these crazy experiments that no one thought was even possible, right? But a separate group in China, there's this big dinosaur pit in China where there's a ton of fossils, and they're finding different feathered dinosaurs that still have some feathers, and other dinosaurs that still have skin. And so, there's just all this evidence that's coming forth now that these different biological materials that have, quote, no business being there, that's a quote from an article, are there. And they can look at the proteins, they can look at um, the structure, and they can, they can see these different biological molecules that degrade pretty readily, right? Um, Uh, also in 2013, uh, Mary Schweitzer again was able to identify actin and tubulin, which are components of pretty much every cell, and they're just structural components. They're involved in keeping a cell having its shape and uh, being able to move and stuff like that. So those are pretty basic proteins that are going to be present everywhere, and she was able to identify those as well. So, okay, so we're saying that, oh man, that's ridiculous that this stuff could have lasted 65 million years, ha uh ha. -huh. But technically speaking, wouldn't those be gone after 6,000 years? Not necessarily. I, so the, the, there was an article that was published that said the half-life of DNA mm -hmm. is 521 years based on random experiments that they did where they just left the DNA or whatever. And they calculated it the same way you can do isotope dating, right? So that they didn't wait 520 million years. But that was the idea is that it decays after 521 years, half of it's gone. But Mary Schweitzer has also been able to identify what look like DNA molecules. So she's gotten 
uh, nucleotides that are connected that are still connected. And those should have decayed, obviously, in 65 million years. So the problem is that the, the different findings don't really correlate with the age, right? Because, yes, if, there, if these things died 65 million years ago, it doesn't really matter the conditions that they're buried perfectly that preserve them. Everything should be gone, right? And so it's, I don't, I don't, I can't explain it, but if you read these articles, it's unbelievable because they all start with, well, we know dinosaurs died 65 million years ago, but look at this awesome stuff that they're coming out with, and we still have to explain how this, you know, can be connected to 65 million years. So there's, there's not a lot of questioning the 65 million years things, even though we're seeing all this evidence of tissue, soft tissue that's been found <coughs> on these fossils. So I don't get it, but that's for scientists to figure out, right? So we're going to bring it back to carbon-14 here at the end, and it wouldn't be possible to date dinosaur bones, right, with carbon-14 dating based on the age of 65 million years, right? That would be insane. So I, I listened to this phone interview, this Christian radio show called uh, Dr. Jack Horner, who was a colleague of Dr. Mary Schweitzer. And so he worked with a bunch of dinosaur digs and all this stuff. And the radio show said, hey, if I raised $20,000 and I gave it to you, would you radiocarbon date your dinosaur bones? Would you just try it to see what it would do? And it's unbelievable because this man wouldn't even do it. He wouldn't agree to it. He wouldn't say, yeah, okay, whatever, we'll run one sample, you know. And then they, they kept up in the price, you know, I'll give you $30,000. I have people ready to give money to do this. And he wouldn't accept. And there's just, if you're a scientist, why wouldn't you at least do it, right? And the, the problem is, in his mind, there's no way it should be there, so why look, right? So this is kind of the the mindset that is going on in secular circles that we already have this established timeline. Why should we see if it's wrong? Yeah. Do you think, I'm thinking back like, you know, not too long ago, relatively speaking, the earth was flat. Yeah. And you know that when evidence started coming out against that, that there was some serious, there was like murders over it. Like, yeah. Literally. So I wonder if, if these guys like see the kind of the tide turning on them, but they're doing all they can to hold on to that, even though it seems to be kind of going against them. No, yeah, I totally agree, and that's that's a great example. And it's that the church especially is what held on to that idea, right? Oh, yeah. That the Earth was flat. Oh. They were the last people to agree that it's round, right? And the that has really killed Christianity in the scientific realm because now Christians don't believe in evolution, right? And articles cite the fact that the church believed the earth was flat in condemnation of them not believing in evolution, right? So, so there's this idea that Christians are really far behind in science because of stuff like that. And yeah, I mean, I, I just can't explain why someone wouldn't at least try it. Yeah, it seems like if you're being honest, yeah. then you should honestly want to know. Right. Unless you do know, and you're freaked out about it. Yeah. So, there's this group called the Paleochronology Group. Pretty sweet. Is that a grant-based group? So, this is, the, this is on their website. This is like the who we are on their website. It says, we are a group of consultants in geology, paleontology, chemistry, engineering, and education who perform research on fossils. We are affiliated with no church or university. We are open to ideas concerning the past history of the earth. We are especially interested in anomalies of science and theories about past cataclysms that have happened on earth and that all scientists acknowledge have happened. We do not have, receive any funding from government foundations. Therefore, we do not hold fast to certain ideas or paradigms for fear of losing our funding or our tenure, which is really a lot of it. We'll get to that even more in a minute. Um, 
We are not all of any particular creed or denomination. We welcome scientific information that may not be published in respected journals due to controversial nature, which we'll get to in a minute. We participate in excavations arranged for carbon, radiocarbon dating of fossil materials at licensed laboratories, work with museums, and prepare reports for publication worldwide. We have investigated fossil material from all over the world. So this group goes around and they collect dinosaur fossils and they send them to radiocarbon labs. Okay, so there are 100 labs, I think, around the world that do this kind of research and they send these different fragments and here's some of their results. They sent triceratops bones. Any guesses how old these triceratops bones are? Remember, they have to be under 55,000, right? Otherwise, it doesn't work. 2,200. 24,340. And they were between 24,340 or 39,000 years old. Okay? They looked at Allosaurus and found 31,000 years old. Acrocanthosaurus. That's a good one. Yep. 23,000 to 32,000 years old. So they, they did the dating on these bones and found that they did register. Interesting thing with that is if there wasn't any carbon 14 and there were give negative results or false results, you would expect it to be at the edge of where it could be detected, right? You'd expect it to be close to 55,000 years old, but it's kind of in the middle, which means that the readings really aren't that bad, right? It's not really an instrument problem because it's kind of in the middle where you would expect to see some detection of this carbon-14. So they presented these uh, results at a conference in Singapore. And they went through the oral presentation, and then later they received a letter from the conference person, which said this. The interpretation which you presented in your abstract is that the age of various dinosaurs previously reported as being Mesozoic in age are less than 50,000 years. Your you report that these ages were calculated using carbon-14 methods. There is obviously an error in your data. The abstract was apparently not reviewed properly and was accepted in error. For this reason, we have excised, exercised our authority as program chairs and rescinded the abstract. The abstract will no longer appear on our website. So there was no, there was no question about, oh, let's look at the data. Can you send us your, your raw data so we can analyze it? There's this ingrained thought that there's no way it could possibly be dated using this method. So let's just throw it out. So the pendulum's really swung from the church being behind the times to yes, modernity sir. being behind the times. So these bone fragments were uh, analyzed at this lab in, at the University of Georgia. Now you tell me. <laughs> it's not good for University of Georgia. Oh. <laughs> At the Center for Applied Isotope Studies. And so they, they were the ones who processed these samples for the paleochronology group as of July 2014, less than a year ago. They refused to process any more samples for the paleochronology group. They sent back their samples, and this is the letter that they sent back. This is from the director, Dr. Jeff Speakman. I have recently become aware of the work that you and your team have been conducting with respect to radiocarbon dating of bone. The scientists at the Center for Isotope Studies and I are dismayed by the claims you and your team have made with regard to the age of the Earth and the validity of biological evolution. Consequently, we are no longer able to provide radiocarbon services in support of your anti-science agenda. I have instructed the lab to return your recent samples to you and to not accept any future samples for analysis. Just complete shutdown. But they're doing the testing. I don't get it. <laughs> exactly, right? So these accredited labs are doing this testing. And yeah, this group isn't testing it. Exactly. That doesn't make any sense. Exactly. And so, of course, the paleochronology group contacted them and said, what's going on? And they talked to the scientists and not necessarily the director. And they were like, I mean, we, we don't know. I mean, we just did it. And you know, there was no explanation for anything that was given. So it sounds like 
And that's where we get to Dr. Mark Armitage. Follow the money. Segway, I win. Okay, so Dr. Mark Armitage was the electron and confocal was. Oh, Keyword. Yeah. The electron and confocal microscopy manager in the biology department at USC Northridge, Southern California. Oh, they're crazy. Yeah. So in 2012, he was invited to an uh, excavation in Montana and he picked up a triceratops horn that he got to keep, I guess. And so he brought it back to he brought it back to his university and did some similar soft tissue analysis and published his results. Okay? Uh oh. That was a problem, right? <laughs> his first mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he also was um, part of a course during the summer where he, it was kind of a lower key course, so he was like talking with his students about it. And then one of the students was like, this is crazy, and went and told this guy's manager about what they were talking about. And so that guy went and had him fired for his anti-science agenda. Same kind of thing, right? And so the paleochronology group, coming back, they got a fragment of this triceratops horn and they sent it off to analysis. Now this was before they got rejected. So this was, this was done at Georgia, University of Georgia. But they dated this triceratops horn to 33,507 years well within the limits of this dating method, right? But that doesn't... Ugh. You're still worried because it's not like 5,000. Yeah, like that doesn't make sense that like, why are we like, oh, this is good that it says it's 33,000 years. Well, that's, it's not 8 million. million. <laughs> but, like, all, all that does is prove that it's not valid, right? But what did we talk about? What was the first part of this lesson on? A lot of assumptions, earth magnetic field, Amount of carbon-14 present. Right. So if, if we take into account these different aspects of pre-flood, right, so it cuts down on the amount of carbon-14 in these dinosaurs, that would elevate the ages. If we take into account the Earth's magnetic field being stronger in the past, less carbon-14 in the atmosphere, that cuts down on carbon-14, which elevates the ages, right? So these different ages aren't the important thing. The important thing is that it's detectable. And then based on the problems with the assumptions, based upon our history of what we know in Genesis, that the flood happened, that the earth was covered in vegetation before the flood, that um, just all that stuff, then we can start to see that there's, there's a possibility that the, the dating method is the problem. It's not necessarily the carbon-14, okay? So that's really all I have. <laughs> See how it all tied together there with a little bow? Impressive. So needless to say, there's a lot of information out there, and I would encourage you guys to check it out. Um, go watch the video. There was a 60 Minutes then on her. Because it's crazy stuff, right? Dinosaur bones that have tissue. And you can see them manipulate the, the tissue. It's pretty cool. But the thing with that is, and I find myself, I find myself when I'm reading some of this stuff, kind of question, well, you know, they're presenting this evidence and there must be some validity to it, right? But at the same time, it, it goes back to this first lesson where we talked about the authority of the Bible. And just because science presents some information doesn't mean that that's true, right? We have to stick to our guns, we have to stick to what the Bible says about the past which is what we'll get into next time we'll talk about creation um, and, and get into some of that stuff so that's what I got for tonight.